Hello there and welcome to Complete Games. I'm James and this is the Aberration Note Read Through for Diana Alteras. Throughout the canon maps and DLCs from Ark Survival Evolved, there are various explorer notes and collectible items scattered across the maps. For every note found, you gain 100 XP and a 10 minute buff effect, doubling the XP that you gain. It's advisable to grab these notes when you're on a creature, as they will also get the boost. But when you piece all of these notes together, they also act as a narrative from the actual survivors intended to tell the story behind the arcs. Diana is a United Republic of Earth, or URE, armed forces fighter pilot from the future, and she leaves her notes as futuristic logs on tablets. Diana only makes 20 entries in her logs on Aberration, so this will be a slightly longer episode, but we will cover the whole story rather than breaking it into two segments like the previous read-throughs. Before we begin, I just want to remind you I'm on Twitter, at JamesCG12, and if you're interested in keeping up with my stream schedule over on Twitch or my upload plans over the coming months, then feel free to drop me a follow there. Thank you. So as always, I invite you guys to sit back, relax, and enjoy the complete notes from Diana Alteras on Aberration. I shouldn't be leading this group. Wow. Wow. That felt good to admit. If I'd have kept that bottled up in my head any longer, my brain was going to explode. I mean, I know why everyone's looking to me. I'm URE Armed Forces, fighting for a free and united Earth, yada yada yada. But I'm just a pilot. Throw me in any squadron you want and I'll be your top stick. Bet your house on it. Just don't expect me to command the damn thing. All I can really do is try to keep everyone's spirits up. Sure, we're in the arse end of nowhere. But a smile and a few laughs can go a long way even in the worst of situations. Can't make rations out of it, but hey, baby steps. You know, this whole staving off the ever-looming spectre of despair thing would be a lot easier without all the dinosaurs. Did I not mention those? I should have mentioned those. Anyway, turns out that raptor attacks aren't great for morale. True story, at least the weather's holding up. We've had clear skies for three days now. It was a good idea to start giving people call signs too. Getting a new call sign from my squadron always made me feel closer to them, whatever it was. Hopefully it works with this bunch. The newbie suggested rubber neck for me, since I keep looking up at the sky, but I can't help it. It really is gorgeous here, a perfect blue. I feel so much lighter now. Sure, part of that might be coming from sleeping in an actual bed, but mostly, I'm just relieved that my ragtag band of rascals is in better hands. This larger group we've joined is way more organised. They've been setting up shelters, mining element and establishing a perimeter for weeks. Not surprising, one of the leaders is URE Special Forces after all. Weirdly, some of the people here are from the Federation, but given our situation, even the Feddies are being team players. Hope that truce holds up when we get this tech gear up and running. The more the camp's grown, the more tense things have become with the Feddies. So today I decided to break the ice. Whatever's happening between the United Republic of Earth and the Turan Federation in the rest of the world doesn't matter. We're all in this together, right? Of course, with my dumb luck. I didn't make nice with just any old Feddy. I unknowingly buddied up with Santiago. Yeah, as in Santiago that's so famous he's got one name. As in the guy who hacked into our URE command one day and reverse engineered our latest tech armour the next. That's Santiago. Turns out he's really into pop music. Super disappointed he's missing the new season of URE Idol. Go figure. The top brass has finally agreed on a plan today. According to our makeshift engineering corps, we've got the resources to cobble together an off-brand flight-ready suit of tech armour in a month or two. One person will then take that armour and leave in search of help. Me. I'm fully certified in tech armour, so I've got a good shot at succeeding. I'm pretty sure that my new buddy was the one who got the other feddies on board. I was the only pick they could agree on. It's a lot of pressure, but this is the kind I like. No big group decisions. Just a set of wings and an impossible mission. That's what Diana Alterez is all about. Ooh baby, I did miss real speed. And the sky? Missed you too, beautiful. That prototype jetpack might not compare to my fighter, but the rush I got was way better than I hoped. Guess I've been stuck here longer than I thought. Santiago's been joking about how much I owe him, but he's more right than he knows. 
I promised to bring in some music for the ride back to civilization. At least I can do for that little nerd. The full set of armor should be done by next week. Then it's finally showtime. So much for that. Less than a day after I set out, my mission hit a wall. Or more specifically, an invisible energy barrier that extends around this entire area. Definitely in my bottom 10 landings of all time. By the way, my shoulder is still feeling it. Once I reported back, I took Santiago to inspect the barrier. He thinks it's also the culprit that's responsible for jamming our long range signals. So basically, as long as this barrier exists, we have no way to reach the outside world. We're completely isolated. Unless, of course, we find a way to take it down. We finally found our target. Apparently those three obelisks on the horizon are attached to some crazy teleportation tech and each one is linked to a fourth signal high above us. Whatever is up there is what we need to take out. Santiago says he can get us there by bypassing the security in one of the obelisk's platforms. Trouble is, we don't know what will be waiting for us and not everyone here is combat ready. So we're going to take the diplomatic approach and make our mysterious hosts a present. The leaders don't want to risk spoiling the surprise so we're discreetly building it in pieces. The whole bomb won't even be assembled until the minute the operation starts. Our captors won't know what hit them. Months of planning, a squad of guys armed to the teeth in the biggest homemade bomb you've ever seen, and we still weren't prepared. How could we be? I don't think anyone could have been ready for that insane shape-shifting whatever it was. It attacked us as soon as we carted the package to the center of the platform. We were getting taken out so fast that we just set the bomb on a short fuse and made a break for it. Less than half of us managed to dive off the platform in time. I could feel the heat of the explosion as I fell. If I hadn't stabilized Santiago on the way down, he'd have been paced too. Of course, with everything that's been happening since we blew up that platform, we might all be screwed anyway. Things have gone sideways in a hurry, and I mean serious foobar. Destroying that platform didn't just weaken the barrier trapping us here. It took out the whole freaking sky. Or at least the giant hologram that was posing as it. So yeah, turns out this entire landmass and everything on it is orbiting the Earth like some kind of artificial space island. Wild, right? I'd appreciate the sheer insanity of all that a lot more if this place didn't feel like it was falling apart. We're taking all we can carry and making a break for that cave system we discovered a while back. If the atmosphere is thicker underground, then we've got a shot of pulling through. Looks like we made it just in time. I backtrack to take a peek at the surface, and it's just one big fire. That's not a metaphor, I mean it's actually burning. I guess some combination of radiation that's leaking through the barrier and the reflecting sunlight is turning it into our own private hellscape. That's not exactly the kind of thing you want in your backyard. So the plan is to keep delving into these caverns. Good news is that they are way bigger than we ever thought. We should be able to set up a pretty extensive base of operations. And after that, better not think that far ahead. Chin up and eyes forward, soldier. Our base is looking pretty fancy these days. We even had enough spare element to whip up some genuine hyper chambers. I'm feeling more rested than ever, yet somehow just as restless. There's no sky to lose myself in anymore. That's the problem. It's left me too much time to think. Weirdly, I keep coming back to my necklace, the Star of David one my mother gave me. Sometimes I catch myself reaching for it, forgetting it's not there. Why is that? I've never been too religious. Better take one of those gliders for a spin to clear my head. They're the only way to fly now that our jetpacks stop working. Maybe I'll think of some dirtier jokes while I'm at it. Holstered one-upped me on the last patrol, and I can't let that stand. I always knew Santiago would come up with a new plan. His taste in pop idols might be questionable, but if anyone can figure out this place, it's him. After studying the obelisks in depth, he's convinced that he can design an amped up version of the teleportation tech that can connect to more distant platforms. Specifically, he would be able to lock onto a signal we discovered a few weeks ago, one that's on a slightly different frequency than the other obelisks we've detected. More importantly, is far, far away from any of them. The scale of this would be massive. We're talking years of work, but everyone agrees it's our best move. The Gateway Project is officially underway. I knew the Gateway Project would be gigantic, but it's still amazing to see how it's grown. We're not even halfway done and it's already a sight to behold. The size is the product of how far we need to travel. 
The greater the distance, the bigger the teleportation matrix needs to be. Of course, that also means we need a lot more power. But we've got a solution for that too, the obelisks. Those bad boys are tapped into this place's main power supply. So in theory, we can hijack that power ourselves. The caveat is we'd need a massive surge of it all at once. And we're not certain how to pull that off. We'll crack the code eventually though. I'm sure of it. Why do I always get picked to check on the obelisk? I really wish they'd send someone else for a change. Every time I have to scale these stupid walls with climbing picks. I wish my armor's jetpack still worked. Even though it hasn't for years. We never did figure out why they lost so much functionality after the catastrophe. Something new in the atmosphere maybe. Still worth wearing when you brave the surface. But I just feel so slow in it. Oh, speaking of armor. I found something weird on my last trip. A burnt out chest plate with some even more crispier human remains. I don't know how, but I think we've got some new arrivals. This woman, Mei Yin, she's not like anyone I've ever met. And not just because she's from hundreds of years in the past. It's those eyes. They're just so intense. It's like staring into a storm. She caused a real stir when we first brought her back to the base with her pet monster. But everyone's used to her by now. Honestly, I think she trusts us way less than we trust her. She only seems to speak when she's doing chores, and she's always got one hand on that sword of hers. I guess that's what it takes to survive all alone like that. But hopefully she'll learn it's okay to let her guard down. Maybe then I can really meet the person behind those eyes. I don't think I really understood hard work until I met May. Whether she's learning how to operate holographic controls or working on her aim, she basically tries as hard as she can all the time. And she hates asking for help. Instead, she'll just scrunch her eyebrows and glare at whatever she's working on until she can think of a solution. It's kind of adorable, to be honest. The only time I think she takes it easy is when she's sparring. That really opened her up. By the way, she even gave me a call sign. Juicy. Although she won't tell me what it means. I'd bet the answer on a match, but I think she'd kick my butt in a heartbeat if it got serious. Those muscles are cheat codes. Well, looks like I'm off on another impossible mission. It's been way too long, if you ask me. So those abandoned structures that the scout team spotted a while back. Well, we're not sure who left them there. But Santiago's saying he's detecting emissions from what could be hypercharged, crystallized element shards in their vicinity. We need those for the Gateway Project's focusing lens, and we haven't been able to make them ourselves. Trouble is, we can't even survive down there without hazard suits, and half of that scout team got torn to pieces by the nastiest, ugliest creatures we've ever seen. This could get bumpy. Mission Log, First Lieutenant Diana Alterez, URE 82nd Fighter Squadron. I'm leaving this for the record in the event of mission failure. We lost most of the team soon after arriving in the area of operations. Roho and Finn got picked off as we neared the target. Hasselt and I are the last remaining assets. I was able to confirm that the target is in the ruins, and I have encoded coordinates within this message. I'm going to leave this behind, and then we'll make one last run at it. Oh, and if someone could read this to me, sorry I'll never make good on that jet ride. You'd have loved it, I promise. I finally finished the necklace. I could have had someone else make it, but that wouldn't have felt right. Not after all May went through to help me. At first I was worried she didn't like it, but it turns out that she just felt guilty for receiving a gift without giving one. Typical, right? So in exchange I finally learned what Juicy meant. Tangerine. This whole time she's been calling me a tangerine. Definitely not the worst ginger-centric call sign I've heard though. And totally worth it for the look on her face. She was so embarrassed. In that moment, I almost leaned in and... But I don't think she understands how I feel. Not completely. Not yet. That's okay. For once, I'm not in a rush. Once we step through that gateway, we'll have all the time in the world. And that concludes the story of Diana Alteras Across Aberration. A slightly longer episode tonight, but being that Diana's logs were slightly shorter than the other survivors, I felt it was better to put it into one episode. Don't forget to let me know down below in the comments what you thought of that episode and Diana's story. And thank you to everybody who's commented and liked on the videos throughout the month of December. I really appreciate the kind words. We will of course be continuing with the Complete Arc series. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten about it. But we kind of just sidetracked throughout the month of December to bring the much requested 
Explorer Notes series. I aim to please, and I hope I've done the note read-through justice, because I do enjoy the lore of Ark, and I've quite enjoyed going over all of these notes and re-familiarising myself with the story as well. Don't forget to subscribe if you're interested in more Ark content from myself. And until next time, I'm James from Complete Games, and I'll see you.